And there is no time like now. Each high holy days, I enter the holidays thinking about our relationship with, for, with time, thinking that we're used to sanctifying time, sometimes a day at a time, and sometimes two days at a time. And these t- 10 days of awe, it's not merely holiday. It's not merely holiness we're channeling. It's awe. It's a connection to God. And that is a connection to time. It feels like our time, especially this year as I've been reflecting on it, and I'm sure others that you have, I've noticed so much how our time is regimented. Those who have had the pleasure and the edification of studying with Rabbi Daberson from Masach Brachot um, this year, wonderful way to spend this, uh, this past year, year and a half, and, and in the past, or studying Masach Brachot in other places, and gap years in Israel, and various Jewish institutions, wonder as they cut their teeth on daf after daf after daf of trying to figure out the right time to say the Shema, let alone everything else. The Shema should be easy. Realize that in many ways, what the Talmud's trying to understand is how do we all get on the same page of time? I thought the answer was easy. You woke up and you said the Shema. Apparently it's not, because then maybe people are not saying it the right time. So then we figure out, well, it used to be said for us in the temple when the priest brought in the truma, but when exactly is that? Because we're not exactly sure when. What are these pages all about? They're about figuring out a way that all of us could disconnect from what would normally be our rhythm of time so that we could share time and we could be doing things at the same time. We could coordinate. It reminded me a little bit of the way we got to daylight savings time. You know, when I first moved here, I was amazed to see see it light outside at almost 10 p.m. sometimes. That was new to me. I was wondering, how did we get here? And of course, I found out, as many of you probably already knew, that it had to do with the train schedules, the introduction of interstate travel in the 19th century, where a train schedule has to know that when you're leaving Toledo at this time, you're arriving in Lansing at this time. And the train schedule has to know across communities and states and people what the same time is. Like the prayers and the blessings and Masachet Brachot, we have to coordinate with one another. And then it was someone's smart idea to help the businesses in, uh, in Michigan and in the urban areas of Michigan. So Michigan instituted daylight savings time before others did. And then when the government came along and established daylight savings time and caught up with Michigan, then the person who had championed it to the Chamber of Commerce and to the state legislature decided, well, if an extra hour of shopping is a good thing for businesses, how about two? So we doubled up on daylight savings time and ended up with 10 p.m. sundown. We had to all be on the same place of time. It was meant because of the possibilities of unity and cooperation in the Talmud and in our nation. Making time standardized and visible using clocks writes Oliver Berkman in his new book, 4,000 Weeks. Standardizing time and using clocks inevitably encourages people to think about it as an abstract thing with an independent existence, distinct from the specific activities on which one might spend it. It's not a resource, something to be bought and sold, something to use efficiently. Before clocks, it was the stuff that life was made of. You may know that the proper name for God is really something about time. Haya, hove, yihye, it was, it is, it will be, somehow combine into some grammatical form, yud he vav he. Becoming time itself. Maybe time is not a commodity, but when we relate to it correctly, it's God when we participate in it correctly. 
we participate in the life of God. Time is a privilege, like the privilege of life itself. It's not a resource. It used to be that the day was lived, not gotten out of the way. And to me, today we measure life in minutes and in hours. A couple of days ago, Lynn was uh, explaining to Ziva Merav, when you do a while as A-W-H-I-L-E, and when you, you do it W-H-I-L-E, and I'm a grammar expert, so I knew exactly what to say. I turned to Google, and I asked Google, Google, what's the right answer? Some of you turned to Alexa, and these are the great rabbis that we have today. And we were answered that the etymology of the word while, W-H-I-L-E, is that it was a unit of time. Originally, according to the etymological dictionary we had, it was the time it takes to recite Psalm 50. We used to measure time and how long it took to recite a psalm. Now we measure it by the resource that we have to get through in order to get to the next thing where I have to meet somebody or I have an appointment or a meeting. And unfortunately, this led to a situation whereby we are driven to control time in the form of productivity. The shared time frame we have with others is a source of demand. It's risky. It's uncertain. We must rise to the occasion of taming it. What was meant to free has enslaved. Berkman writes, it's scary to confront the truth that almost every, anything worth doing from marriage to parenting to politics on and on, depends on cooperating with others and therefore exposing yourself to the emotional uncertainties of relationships. The time of community was meant to allow us to be together and accomplish things together. It was meant to find our way to a space that we shared, that humanized us, not tortured us. Every decision to use a portion of time on anything seems to represent the sacrifice of all the other ways in which you could have spent that time but didn't. And to willingly make that sacrifice is to take a stand without reservation on what matters most to you. This confrontation with limitation also reveals the truth that freedom sometimes is to be found not in achieving greater sovereignty over your own schedule, but in allowing yourself to be constrained by the rhythms of community, participating in forms of social life where you don't get to decide exactly what you do or when you do it. And so it can lead to the insight that meaningful productivity often comes not from hurrying things up, but from letting them take the time that they take the time inherent to the process itself. In other words, time used to be task-oriented. You didn't have to look at the clock. You milked the cow. And you milked the cow for as long as the cow needed to be milked. And then you ate. You ate as long as the meal took. And then you moved on to the next task. And so life was broken up into tasks. Maybe if you were lucky to be an ancient Hebrew and you were a shepherd, you would find yourself with the goats out in the hills and watch as they munched on their weeds and brush, made sure none run, ran away, and composed psalms that later we would count time and how long it took to recite them. Ritual today is meant to teach us about allowing time to be. Some people will ask me, Rabbi, can you tell me when the Torah service ends tomorrow? And I can tell you exactly when the Torah service is going to end tomorrow because I've spent years working on it. The Torah service is going to end when we've read the Torah and talked about what it means and then dressed it up and put it back in the ark. And after that is exactly when the Torah service is going to end. We would let process dictate how the time unfolded. I feel like in this past year and a half, 
a little bit of that sense of time has snuck back into my life. A little bit of the sense of time that this is going to take how long it takes. And I will get to the next thing when I get to the next thing. But I'm going to be with the person I'm with now. Or I'm going to be on the call I'm with now. Or I'm making the meal that I'm making now. And I'm not rushing to the next meeting or to the next meeting. I feel we lost something this year when a creeping insight into that gave way to the demand for productivity. And we all, as we were all patting each other on the shoulders about how we're relaxing and not forcing each other to do as much as they did before, that quickly gave way to expecting people to do exactly as much as they did before, only now it was 10 times harder. Now it had to be, well, we have to figure out how to do this, and we have to figure out how to do that, and I have to go through 10 procedures just to make a batch of fries, and I got to do 10 of this and 10 of that. It's amazing to see what the staff of the synagogue has done. Someone wrote a brilliant idea to us. They said, well, what if I'm at synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, and I feel like I need to be outside? Could you set up a tent so I could watch the service outside? And, and so I asked Amanda. I said, Amanda, can you do that? And Amanda said, we'll do that. And Amanda and Beth and others, and we got the sukkah up, and we said it's going to sink into the mud, but we'll figure it out. And then we called people to see if they could help, but people are busy, and that's okay. And we put it up. Everything we can do to try to make things, everything takes 10 times longer. Everything is 10 more options. I want to bring us back to that sense of time, not as a commodity, not something in which we judge ourselves by our productivity, but where we give up our control and allow ourselves to live in time, to live in God. I was listening to a guy on NPR about email, and it was a book on email and how email is destroying the economy, and I wasn't fully following it. And he basically said, look, I've got hundreds and hundreds of emails, and I couldn't return them all, because after all, we've created a system which makes perfect sense, which is anyone in the world, at any moment of their convenience, can immediately ding you on your phone with something they'd like from you, and they'd like it as soon as possible. And you're only one person, so you can only answer so many, but the entire world is open to emailing you at any moment, so somehow that's supposed to make sense. And what he said in his study is, he tried really, really hard to say, every time I get an email, I'm going to respond to it right away. And he got through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails, and guess what happened? Everyone started emailing him more, because he was the one person who was answering emails. So now instead of being behind on hundreds of emails, he was behind on thousands. He says in his work with uh, corporations, he's found that many, many workers, since they're spending their time at work answering emails, the real work that they have to do they do it home and at night and on their off time because it's the only time they can actually get to it. We filled our time with making ourselves productive and it hasn't made us more present and it hasn't given us peace. We fill time like we filled the mold of the golden calf. The more we could put, we could put in it, the better it felt. But the mold had no purpose. It was a pre-done mold. Rather than shaping our lives around the natural and holy processes of being with people, of being with nature, of being in the moment with the processes that we do. Not controlling, but being present. I want to give a shout out to i am probably pronounce his name wrong, even though I know his work. The philosopher Fritjof Bergman, who passed away this past May. I knew Bergman's work from a long time ago. And of course, here at the University of Michigan in the philosophy department, I imagine there are people who are listening right now who knew him. I never got to meet him. He was born in Berlin, Germany, to a Jewish mother and non-Jewish father, just as the Nazis were coming to power. They fled with him as a baby, to a remote Austrian mountain village. One afternoon, the Gestapo arrived at Bergmann's home with the local police, waiting to take Frischoff's mother to the concentration camps. At the time, Mrs. Bergmann was at the dentist, some 25 miles away. And the local police 
um, convinced the SS officers to return the next morning to get her. The family staged her suicide that night in a nearby lake. When the Gestapo came in the morning, they found the family stricken with grief over an apparent suicide, no trace of the body. His mother dressed up in an old nurse's uniform from World War I and strangely got on the same train that they were exporting Jews back to Germany for the death camps. And she ended up back in Germany where she miraculously lived out the rest of the war under her false identity. Her job nursing American prisoners of war back to health. Remember, she was dressed as a nurse. Back in the Austrian mountain town, Fritzhoff's father was imprisoned with no caretakers in the brutal atmosphere. The Gestapo figured we die anyways, he says. And so the five children were left to fend for themselves in the village. And they did. Fritzhoff wrote an essay that got him a scholarship to, to study in the United States. He studied at my alma mater and made his professional career here at the University of Michigan. One of his major contributions is to say that we are less free than we think. We are free when we do purposeful activity that connects with how we identify with meaning, identify with what we should be doing in the moment. And he invented the concept of new work. And he went out to Flint, Michigan when they were closing the car plants and the GM and Ford plants, and he talked to workers and tried to build a program for them moving forward. He wrote, new work is simply the attempt to allow people for at least some of their time to do something they passionately want to do, something they deeply believe in. Most people assume that the job system we have today has existed since the Stone Age, and it's therefore unthinkable that we could actually suddenly run out of jobs. But our job system is only 200 years old, and automation will threaten the system that we have. His idea, you could call it utopian, or for utopian, he put his money where his mouth was, working with unemployed workers. And his idea was this. If we could all live simpler lives with less, then we could allow the mass-produced goods that are coming for us through automation. And we could then work maybe half the year at a, an occupation. His idea in the plants, which he introduced, he tried to convince the uh, the companies was rather than fire half the workers and employ half the workers, whether they could employ all of the workers for half the year and the other you know, half for the other half. And then he worked with the workers who were not working to find ways of occupying their time with things that identified with being in purposeful work. It may seem utopian, but I wonder if it's coming for us. I've looked at all the people who've been quitting their jobs over the pandemic. I look at the people who say, I'm tired of answering the question, asking the question, do you want fries with this? I'm tired of people threatening me when I ask them to wear a mask, which I'm required to do by my boss. I'm tired of people, I'm tired of working in a job in which I can't get ahead, and which leads me not to have positive thoughts about how I'm performing and whether my productivity is where it needs to be. I wonder if we can head into the High Holy Days with a sense of the High Holy Day call to time. The Vidui reminds us that we can't be everything. So let us decide what it is purposefully we intend to be. Time is finite, but that doesn't mean, as Una Tana Tochef would have us internalize, the fact that time is finite, don't let it scare you. Embrace it. So that the time you use, the time it's, I shouldn't even say use, the time in which you flow and the processes that you identify with, where you give up the attempt to try to control it all and you find a way to be in it. Find your way to that living in awe. I close with five questions to think about 
They come from this initial book I quoted from Oliver Berkman to try to reorient ourselves to time. So after each one, I'm just gonna pause for a moment and then I'm gonna invite Jeffrey and Deborah up to sing. Maybe some of those questions will still linger and then we'll close out the service. Where in your life or your work are you currently pursuing comfort when what's called for is a little discomfort? Pursuing the most important projects means not feeling in control of your time. It might mean having difficult conversations. It might mean disappointing others. It might mean disappointing yourself. So in other words, if you're, trying, if you're judging by pro, being productive, you're trying to please. And what if you're willing to enter uncomfortable places of not pleasing others or yourself, of allowing you or others to be disappointed, to change from productive to a different way of using your time? Number two. Are you holding yourself to and judging yourself by standards of productivity or performance that are impossible to meet? Number three, in what ways have you yet to accept the fact that you are who you are, not the person you think you ought to be? Can we accept that maybe no one really cares what we're doing with our life? that there is nothing we need to do to earn our place on this planet. All the ways we trap ourselves, that we think we need to be something that we're not able to be that productive to be. But we should be that thing because people care that we become that thing. What if we could accept that people would accept our choices about what to do with our life and that we wouldn't have to be what we think we need to be so that we can tell them we're being that thing. Number four, in which areas of life are you still holding back until you feel like you know what you're doing? And five, how would you spend your days differently if you didn't care so much about seeing your actions reach fruition. True wisdom is that the work of parenting, of community building, and everything else has the quality of not being completable without, within our own lifetimes. What actions, what acts of generosity or care for the world, what ambitious schemes or investments in the distant future might it be meaningful to undertake today if you could come to terms with never seeing the results?